So I'm going to have another session tomorrow, and we'll talk more about the cover crops and things like that. But I know that um, Blake is coming out here next, to, and he's going to talk about the practical aspects of everything that I've talked about more from the sort of the fundamental side. But I have time for questions right now, so why don't you just, you know, you've all put your big boy and girl learning pants on, so we'll have at it. Yes. No, here. <coughs> uh, first, I'd like to thank you for a really interesting presentation. I'm uh, intrigued by earthworms. Okay. And uh, in this part of the world, most of the earthworms, if I understand it correctly, are not native. And as they move north up into uh, the forest, they have a fairly destructive effect on uh, forest dynamics. And is there something we should be paying attention to for the earthworm communities so that we get either the right balance or the right performance of the here. Okay, so I'll repeat the question for everybody. Um, this was more, um, this is about earthworm ecology. And um, some of you may or may not know that when we get into the Carolinian forest, you get a little bit farther north from here, um, Lumbricus terrestris or our night crawlers are being fairly destructive and actually inhibiting the regeneration of the Carolinian forest um, because they produce these middens. And the middens are really like a big compost pile, so they poop into it. And then they hold all the food around it, and they never leave it. So they just keep pooping out into it. And they, but, but by the same token, they have their tail in there, and then they just forage from all around, and they're just pulling it all up into the midden. Um, these earthworms will live for 8 to 10 years as an individual, so they're very long-lived. They don't reproduce a whole lot because they are long-lived, and they require upcrossing. So a lot of earthworms um, require can, can self. But um, these earthworms actually have to have another individual. So rainstorms are really good opportunities to go on a walk about and find a mate, and, you know. Um, and nighttime too, you'll see it. Um, Lombricus, but the one thing I would say is that you were right at the end of the glaciation from the last glaciation. Um, a lot of stuff was bulldozed down into your area. There are native earthworms here, quite a few of them actually. Um, they'll probably be more of your forests, for sure. Um, and there's not a lot of evidence that all earthworms, Lombricus terrestris we know came over from Europe, but some of the other ones, the earthworkers, that you also have in the soil, the little guys that work up and down and the ones that work at the top. Um, and there's not, I mean, when we look at genetic drift, that there's not the same, we're not exactly always sure that they were all introduced. So let's, We'll just leave that a little bit. Um, when we terrestrials, the one thing I tell people is if you don't have earthworms, do not seed those because they require so much um, biomass. And the other thing is we can't have some soil erosion with them because they, they mitten it up. And as long as their middens are distributed randomly, but you can get a good rain and then have all the soil washing away from around them uh, because you don't have soil cover. So um, never seed them. If they come, they come. Um, and you just take it as a sign that you're doing a good job of not disturbing. If you're doing a bit of tillage, you won't have them because they can't take tillage at all. Um, the lumbricus terrestrials can't. The other ones take a little bit of it, but we still have issues when we do tillage. And that's the one thing that I would say, now that you've asked me about earthworms, is that tillage is totally detrimental to earthworms. And it doesn't matter where I go in this world. Um, people say, well, I have great populations of earthworms, even though I do tillage. Um, yeah, you probably do. You just don't have the diversity that somebody else ha might have without them. You may have only two or three species, or somebody else not doing as much tillage would have five or six. Um, so that's that's also about watching the whole movie again. You know, you know, uh, it's just one of those things. Um, the other thing is, is feeding diversity is good. Um, more diverse, more green. And the other thing is, if you do start to get them reconstructed, you start to have that. Go to Seeding, and I know that Vin, um, Blake is going to talk about this. He's going to talk about actually how you can seed um, covers into your standing crop so you get an understory. That is very helpful. So that is the one thing that we can really do that's helpful. Okay, I had a question here, and then I'll go up there. Okay, sir? So to use your phrase, watching the whole movie, uh, those of us that were in the soils class this morning and yesterday learned about how looking at the whole movie of corn and soybean production, we talked about soybean as being a nitrogen credit, and it's actually not. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then here a few moments ago, you talked about how some varieties of clover also may be advertised as a nitrogen contributor, but in the whole picture, they're not. Right. So as producers that are trying to add legumes and add cover to be a net nitrogen contributor, how do we even figure out what the whole picture is versus looking at a piece of 
sales literature that says, oh, grill peas and you're going to get 150 pounds of nitrogen. How do we learn that whole picture? Ah, okay, so how do we learn the whole picture? I want to grow my own nitrogen, but we know that a lot, some of these plants and soybeans too, to a certain extent, are non, are actually net users and not givers and are, are donors. So how, how do we, how do we figure this out? Well, one of the things we can figure out is, um, and I will talk a bit about this, but you can look at what is my, one of the things we need to do a Haney test or actually do um, a respiration test so that you can see what is the potential of my soil to supply nitrogen on its own. Okay? And if you are a really high potential to supply nitrogen on your own, then you're going to look for some more wild type or even some peas are going to be okay for that. But if you've got a lot of nitrogen, you're not going to have all legumes are going to be net users rather than fixers when you have a lot of nitrogen in your soil. There isn't one legume that is going to say, I am going to give photosynthate and nutrients to a rhizobium nodule when I have all this to have without and I don't need it. So one of the, one of the mistakes people actually make is by using a lot of fertilizer, you are actually making them net users. So one of the things we can do is when you become more efficient at this and you know that you know your soils have less potential, or what you can do is do some other plants that have other properties um, that will actually allow for more nitrogen fixation and fix nitrogen in a different way with your free living nitrogen fixers. Because where you are, um, you probably can take advantage of azosperlum and azotobacter, which are free living nitrogen fixers, which are probably going to work a little different, are going to work differently, and they don't require the same carbon from the plant in order to do what they're doing. Um, the other thing is to break up some of the other nutrients that you need too, because phosphorus is a big one. So let's use some more buckwheat and some of these things to actually get some of those. But there are ways, and um, I actually have some stuff on that. So in the next, pre since people are seem to be interested in that, I'll, I'll put some in the next presentation so that we can talk a little bit about what different plants do and why we would use them in combination. Okay. <coughs> Worms in the prairie. Yes, native worms will be in native prairie, and and we'll call those refugia. So if you have areas that haven't been haven't been plowed or in treed areas like some of the tree breaks and in your shelter belts and stuff, you'll have a lot of native stuff that you wouldn't have necessarily in your ag field. Yes. Okay, um, so one of the questions was, is how long does it take to go from a conventional farm to having earthworm? Um, I, I know everybody hates when you say the word depends, right? It depends. Um, so, but it, it does. Um, I, can, I can go from one earthworm, earthworm per square meter to 303 years if I can use cover crops and do things. Uh, if I can use a pasture, I can do that too. Um, if I'm going to do it cropping and I go to no-till, then my crop sequence, I can do it in five, probably. And, and actually, I've done it in five. So that gives you a little idea about how that works. Okay, I have a question here and then over there, and then I'll come back. Yep, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Okay, so inundation, flooding, um, standing water. Um, okay, that is never good. Um, what that usually does is we, we start off with dissolved oxygen and then the oxygen eventually disappears and we go into anoxia and then we start to get uh, anaerobic respiration which means that we, we actually denitrify a lot of the nitrogen that's in our fields. So we actually lose a lot of it into the environment, so it's gassed off at this point. Um, and we, we build a lot of organisms, uh, microbiology, that actually uses alternative sources for energy. So we can actually do some depletion of um, sulfur and some of our metals um, because we are actually 
they're, they're being put into the microbial biomass. Now, the good news about that is, is that when we dry out, we've actually put those into an organic form, which is more easily available. So, you know, there's the bad side and then the good side. The other thing is, is that, and people often ask me about earthworms and that too, um, a lot of them will block their burrows and they can live in water for a long time as long as it's not salty um, and as long as it's actually water and not full of salt and, and, and ions and things like that, which can burn them. So you're going to recover. The other thing is, is because you're suffering from inundation um, and more and, and more water in areas, and you think about it for five years and you go, okay, well, this is a bit of a trend now, maybe. Um, I should think about this. So one of the things to think about in that situation is think about growing things like sunflowers and things that have big tap roots or growing a cover crop or actually putting something in like lakes that I talked about in between your rows like radishes and stuff that are actually little reservoirs that are going to help drain things and keep your soil more green. Um, the other thing is to think about having more earthworms so that you actually allow your soil to drain a little bit better. That's another thing. So, and, and radishes and brassicas and things like that, um, they're, and they're like Red Bull for earthworms, so they just go crazy on it. So that's another reason why you can modify things by modifying your rotation and your sequences and the plants in it. So there are some things we can do to help mitigate that, for sure. Yeah, and now, yes? Um, I thought that slide was back up. Is there a merit to warming up because of energies that are going on in that soil, or is it just not like warm? 
Okay, so now I'm, I'm going to try and restate that. Um, so one of the questions was, am I not, I'm just going to go straight to the point. If, if I have a really healthy soil and, um, and it's really biologically active, is it warmer, is that warming the soil compared to, or is it just sunlight that's going to warm my soil? And uh, obviously I want warmer soil because I want my corn plant to come out of the ground faster and that would really help me as an organic farmer. Is that correct? Got it. Okay. Um, the answer is, is yes. As you develop more biologically active soils, they are warmer um, because they are spending a lot of energy, because they are respiring. Um, a perfect example of that would be um, with Neil Dennis from Saskatchewan, Arcola, Saskatchewan. Um, Neil's prairie soils, I mean, two years ago they froze eight feet. His wells were frozen. Um, and uh, he warmed up sooner than anybody else. Uh, and, and actually had bare spots on the field. Gabe Brown will see bare spots where nobody else will have bare spots because of the, the heat coming off of the soil. Um, I hear that a lot. Um, one of the other things that happened this year was um, uh, Dr. Franton from uh, North Dakota State University lowered the requirement, the nitrogen requirement for corn by 50 pounds of the acre if you were mental for six years or more, which was good news. I mean, and he'd done all the studies, I mean, because the farmers, and, and really kudos to him because the farmers have been telling him, look, when I'm in the system, and I actually am a systems person, and I have a system for more than six years. I, I know I don't need to use all that stuff. I know I don't. And yet I have to use it because for, for crop insurance purposes and stuff. So he said, you know, can you please do this study because we're tired of this. And he did, and he lowered them, and it was big news. I mean, everybody's like, really? 50 pounds to the acre? I mean, that's a lot. Um, but that's a requirement in North Dakota State from North Dakota State this year. So, um, you know, it can happen. And that's about warming, that's about biological activity. That's all those things. That's, that's, that's important. If you want, and again, I've talked about this, but those links are on my website. So if you want to read that study, there's a link there, and you can read it. Um, and, and just while people are formulating their quite more questions, um, there's also, I have a link on the website to Dr. Jack Schultz's talk. Um, TED Talk on plants and how plants communicate. And if you really want to blow your mind, you can uh, you can listen to his talk. He's from Columbia, Missouri, um, from the University of Missouri, and he gives an amazing talk on how plants communicate. It really is quite quite something. Yes, go ahead. When it comes to earthworm populations, what element, if it's uh, say too much calcium or too much silica? What element really hurts the population of earthworms? Chloride. Chloride. Mm -hmm. What would be the second? Um, it's not sand like everybody thinks. Um, sand, uh, earthworms will live in sand quite well. And gravel, yeah, no, gravel isn't going to be helpful. Um, so soils that tend to have a lot of gravel in them will be, have really, sh yeah, really shallow, the earthworms will all be really shallow, um, and you won't get the deep burrowers because then the gravel's not going to work. I know a guy that puts an awful lot of uh, coal burn gypsum on. Mm -hmm. He's got relatively healthy soil, raising three crops, no earthworms. Zero. Okay, and I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the gypsum. Um, what it does mean that um, probably something is out of balance. The calcium, you know, uh, gypsum tends to be really drying too. Like I don't know if you've applied gypsum, you know that it'll suck the moisture out of your hands and stuff. And that could be not because of the gypsum itself, but because of the indirect effect of the gypsum drying. And if they get it on them, they dry. And they have to be in a moist environment and be able to stay moist because they breathe through their skins. So they're breathing through their skin, and they're exuding things through their skin. So, <coughs> excuse me, fine powers like gypsum can't, although they will drag it through and things like that, they have to be able to get away from it because it's so drying. Yes, go ahead. Do 
Aerial seed. Yes, you can. Um, aerial seeding. Okay, can I, oh, I repeat the question? Can I aerial seed buckwheat? Um, yeah. The one of the things that we have with aerial seeding is about having the weight. Buckwheat is a heavier seed, it's angular. So yeah, buckwheat is one of those seeds. That's why radishes work so well. So all of you in here, how many pounds of radish do you use? All right, you never ever exceed. I mean, never ever exceed two pounds of radish in a mix ever. Okay, that's just a little hint. Never do that. What? Can you elaborate, Jill, please, for the audience? Um, I will elaborate. Yeah, I can elaborate. Were you going to talk about this? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, you never want to use more because what happens is it takes over and then nothing else grows. Um, and the other thing is the seed can be quite expensive, so there's no point in using more than you really need. Um, so that's another thing. Um, uh, and, but if you wanted a crop, or if you really wanted to remediate something, so for example, if you were to use David Brandt's peas and um, radish mix, then you are, you probably have to three pounds to the acre to do that. Um, and that definitely gives you a lot more radishes, but that's, that's really deciding that you want to use the radishes for a reason. And, and so this, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but if you're in a mix, one and a half to two pounds is quite good. Yes, go ahead, and then I'll come back here. Uh, we've been composting for 30 some years on the Turner for organic, you know, all our nitrogen, livestock, manure, and legumes, of course, never buy any nitrogen. But I'd like to know your thoughts on the compost and manure in terms of. Okay. What about manure sourcing? Composting manure. Uh, so the question was about composting manure and getting nutrients from manure and talking a little bit about that. I think compost is a great product. Um, and I think composting manure is really good. I mean, and, and we had this conversation, I've had this conversation a few times now about what, well, what if I inject liquid manure and things like that. Composting manure is always better. I mean, it is. Um, now, there's some really interesting things happen when you graze animals and they walk out there and they, you know, leave their manure on the field um, and they trample it in and there's all this other plant material to accumulate. I mean, that, that tends to work really well. Um, whereas if we're spreading, that's a lot different. I think that's about quantity of what we're, so that's why compost manure is always better. Compost is too, and we're getting rid of some of the nasty things that are in there, we're getting rid of some of the salts, some of the really toxic things, and then we're putting on a source of pre-digested organic matter. So there's a lot of advantages to, to compost for sure. Um, we can use different composts like hog manure and chicken manure, all have different properties and they're different digestive systems. Um, and that's the important part about this is that when you've got rumen, Pigs are monogastrics, and then you've got the chickens. And they all have slightly different digestive systems. They all inoculate the manure a little differently. They all process their food a little differently, which means that you have a different product. And uh, with poultry manure and, and pig manure, you need to be really careful about the phosphorus. Because I tell you folks, um, if when you have too much of something, that is a problem. You're better to have not enough of everything than have too much of one thing. Because too much of a thing is really hard to get rid of. Um, there's a, a farmer in West Virginia that um, I know, and he put on a lot of poultry manure. And, you know, thinking, well, I've got all these broilers, I'm going to use manure, things like that. And we are mining it now. I mean, we have run buckwheat all the time to try and mine off the phosphorus because every year you have to add phosphorus and every year you're adding more nitrogen because as the phosphorus becomes more available, then we need more nitrogen. And it's like this never-ending connection between everything that means we need more. And it's like, well, how can we need more phosphorus when you got all this in here? Well, it's tying everything up, which means that I have to put more on to do some other things. So this is where I would encourage you, and, and this is where soil tests are useful, 
this is where plant tests are really useful, is to know how much you have. And, and to think about, well, do I need more? Um, and, and really monitor your nutrients and monitor how much manure you're putting on and things like that. I mean, it, it's an important thing. Okay, I have somebody over here, and then I'll come over here, okay? And then I have you here. So he, actually, this man's first, so go ahead. Is there any value, or first of all, I guess it's a, it's a research question. Is anybody looking at relative sizes of the microbial loop versus arthropod? So it's sort of a micro versus arthropod ratio in the soil. And is there any value in knowing something about that relationship? Okay. Um, have, has there been research on the um, microbial community, the abundance of microbes, and how that's related to the abundance of microarthropods, and would that ratio be something that we could use from a soil health perspective, I'm presuming? Um, there has been, and so what I'll tell you about microarthropods is they tend to live really much in um, what we'll call with detritus bear, which is where all that litter from the surfaces is in. And that's why your stoker in that is so important in residues on the surface, because they live in the top inch of your soil primarily. They will move down, but most of them will be in the top. And they are really important for breaking down surface residues. The one thing we know is that um, fungal colonization of the residues will drive microbial, uh, drive microarthropod populations. So if you have a low bacterial to fungal ratio, um, which means you have more fungi and less bacteria, you will have more microarthropods because they prefer to feed on plant material that's colonized by fungi. And there's a reason for that too, is because the fungi tend to hold on to the nitrogen longer, so it's a richer source for them, so they get more out of it, so it's more efficient. Okay, I have, I have time for one more question. You asked a question before. So there was another man over here I know who hasn't asked a question. So I'm going to go over here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm interested in uh, clover as a, as a green grower crop plant over with clover. And after looking at the slides about clover and perhaps uh, that's an end reduction to the next, I'm wondering if you have any recommendations either about how much magazine you can start with, whether the clover actually produces that in the state, or if there's something else. Okay. Uh, the question was, I was thinking about using oats and clover, and now I'm not so sure, and what could I use? Um, actually, that is a really nice question, because oats are also big nitrate users, and then you've got clover that would be a nitrate user. Now, if you had lots of excess nitrate, they would be holding it for you. If you don't, then oats and peas are very nice. Um, and oats and lentils. Um, things like that, yeah, that uh, will be a little bit of a net user, but they will start to produce their own. Um, depending on when you're growing it, even oats and fallow beans, um, all very nice. And, and, and the mix that you want to have, and this is hard for people, is you want to be 60% uh, legume and 40% uh, of your cereal in order to get a really good mix. Because otherwise your, your oats will choke up if you go less, your oats will choke up everything, your legume out to a certain extent. And, and you really want your legume, and you want them to be pretty harmonious and working together synergistically. And they won't do that if you don't get that mix. Okay, I know I'm out of time. So I want to thank you all for being here today, taking your time out of your day to listen to me. I really appreciate that. And um, I'll see you all tomorrow sometime. So thanks. <laughs>